And welcome in once again to the most accurate podcast here at 44 Fantasy Football. I am Matt Okada. I am joined by John Paulson, and that is it. It is just a duo pod today, John. It is the last Wednesday before the Wednesday that is opening day eve. That's how I'm that's how I'm uh naming this day. How are you? That's a mouthful. Uh I'm doing all right. Yes, we've given you uh listeners a gauntlet of guests but today we're just going to talk about some late round strategy sleepers etc but i think we have some some news from yesterday we do yeah we have a bunch of news from yesterday because yesterday was the cut down to 53 day in the nfl so there was a lot of interesting stuff a lot of players placed on pup or injured reserve the short-term version also some players placed on the long-term version uh, that have some fallout and then just some other random news that popped up. So we will hit through that. And then as John mentioned, dive into some late round gems, some deeper sleepers targets in those last few rounds of your draft, potentially that can end up being the league winners. It's easier to find them. Well, it's hard to find the league winners, but if you're going to find them, it's usually in those rounds. So let's get to this news first off the top. We will start with what is possibly the hottest topic of discussion. The last, 12 to 18 hours as of when we're recording this Wednesday morning. And that is Kyron Williams being named by Sean McVay as the punt returner. Seems like the primary punt returner in Los Angeles. He said a lot of interesting things in the interview about this, specifically that, you know, the backups there will have the ability to spell Kyron if need be. It sounds like the idea is they want to get the ball in his hands more, which fair enough. But obviously the initial reaction is, well, we don't really want our second round pick getting punt returns. It sounds like extra injury risk. John, how are you navigating this? And are you reacting as heavily as much of the industry? No, I think I'm uh, on the calmer side of things. I also, it's a great way to circle back to coach speak uh, index, Greg Branos, who Mm -hmm. came on the pod, uh, recently and uh, he uh, posted a Sean McVay presser where this came out, this news came out and um, you know, we also gravitated towards the being able to spell him if need be quote unquote does not sound like his RB one role is changing or that he is suddenly the RB two or anything like that. So I think there's, I will agree that it's weird that you have your RB one returning punts but it doesn't mean that he's not the RB1. It's just a little odd a thing. And uh, I think Mike Clay just uh, posted uh, an interesting thing because he looked back at last season and uh, Kyron handled uh, all of the punt returns during weeks one through three of last season and played 86% of the offensive snaps, 39 carries, 19 targets during that span. Then he they got him off of the punt return thing to facilitate a feature back role. Um, and then people are like, well, they didn't, you know, why would they pull him off there if he's going to be, so if he's going to go back and on the punt returns, he's not going to be a feature back. And, you know, it's just like, it's already baked into his projections because he was the fantasy RB two last year. And even if he only gets 65% of the touches in this backfield, he could still post overall RB two numbers based on the numbers I crunched for him, uh, you know, given what his touches would be reduced to and how productive he was with those touches. So I'm not worried about this. I think he's still a solid RB one. He's going in the second or third round. If he goes in the third round, I think you're getting a pretty good deal. Yeah. I will also point out one, the way that McVeigh worded the, the backups can spell him if need be really honestly sounded like a positive for Kyrie yeah. as opposed to yeah. a, yeah. So uh, He's the locked and loaded starter, I think. They just, I think, honestly do want to get the ball in his hands. Also worth noting, I can't remember who I saw this that tweeted, so I wish I could give them credit. But somebody pointed out that Cooper Cup was a primary punt, quote, returner for McVay in 2021. But if you look at his return stats, you actually don't imagine that. You don't see any because he only returned one. But he had 20 fair catches, which I think was close to the lead league that year. That was the year he was triple crown winner as a receiver. So maybe they just trust Kyron Williams to catch the ball and not muff it, which, again, fair enough. Uh, I, I agree, not concerning, not don't overreact, still draft him. In my opinion, early second round, he's a top six, seven running back. I actually took him into Scott Fishbowl, and I saw Scott tweet out, Ooh. 
yeah. targets for Kyron. It's got you know, he hashtag just Scott Fishbowl. So I thought that was pretty funny. If he does get some return yards, holy mackerel, he could be the RB one overall. Um, I mean, he could do that anyways. Uh, one other um, interesting piece of news that is less specifically cut or injury related is the Samaj P. Ryan. There is talks that the Broncos are trying to trade him rather than just cut him. I think the most interesting question is where would he go? I wasn't too concerned about him in Denver. I love Javante Williams and didn't really think that Samaj was going to be a problem. But are there places you think he could go that he could either be hurtful to a starter or useful for fantasy himself? Now, I saw that he was cut. Is that actually not the case? He's still on the roster. Oh, did that happen? I thought I Is saw that a live yesterday. News thing? Unless, well, no, it might be just people with conjecture that they thought he was cut, but he was actually, they're trying to trade. Just double No, it looks it. like they did. They were trying to trade him, but release him. Okay. Okay. A uh, uh, brand new updated news information. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Um, okay, so then that just brings up the, the Javante thing. Yeah, uh, arguably someone will some sign some AJP Ryan. So the question still could still remain. However, in the meantime, it's Javante Williams. It's Jaleel McLaughlin. I think a lot of people consider him a decent sleeper. Maybe we'll get mm -hmm. into him later in the show. We'll see. But I think that this does solidified that the Broncos are confident in Javante, confident in his health. Um, do you see Samaje signing anywhere of note? Yeah, I mean, I think he's a capable, versatile running back. He's not a like a star runner or anything, but he can get you some yards uh, rushing, and he's also you know good in pass protection and catching the ball. So I think he'll land somewhere as the RB2, RB3, and it could be a headache for whoever he lands with in terms of the, the starter there. Um, I, for me in Denver, yes, it's, it's, you know, we feel better about Javante. I think we, you know, heading into this off season, we were sort of thinking that Samaj P. Ryan might be the odd man out just given the fact that they yeah. have J Jaleel McLaughlin and, and they drafted Audric, uh, Estime and they felt really good about him and, um, or, you know, there's some hype about him. So they're going very, very young. They obviously got rid of Tim Patrick as well, who apparently like, <laughs> I thought he won the wide receiver yeah. two job there. Uh, but he's 30, 31, and they want to just go super young, it looks like, at, at all positions, almost all positions. So, um, And that includes P. Ryan. So I think this is the best. I mean, I don't think this is the best. The, the biggest beneficiary of this is Jaleel McLaughlin, I think, because all those, a lot of yeah. those uh, passing down snaps are uh, opened up, and he's probably going to be the guy on those downs uh, if Javante is not out there. So, And there's also a chance that Javante is the three down back, but I think it's more likely they're going to rotate. Worth noting on that point, uh, Samaje had 50 catches on 56 targets last year. I think that largely gets forgotten somehow, and that's with Javante being also a solid pass catching back. So Sam he absolutely could go somewhere, and if not be fantasy relevant in PPR perhaps, which is possible depending on where he goes, be a problem for whoever is the starter in the, ter in the sense that, as he did last year, he could take away pass uh, passing snaps. One interesting one I would throw out there is just the Ravens because they don't have the sol solid Gus Edwards behind their starter anymore. Of course, they never really had a healthy starter. Gus Edwards ended up the starter most of those years. But that, that would be an interesting one because Derrick Henry historically doesn't catch a ton of passes, even though he should. Samaj is the kind of guy who's a solid backup to have. Yeah, he could, he could we'll usurp uh, Justice Hill. Like, right now, I think Justice Hill is supposed yeah. to be the third down back, and th that would be an interesting mm -hmm. spot for him. Plus, they, they'd be very familiar with him being in the same uh, division all those years. Yep. All right, let's get to some of the injury-specific stuff. Jonathan Brooks did hit Pup, which means he will not be playing for the first four weeks of the season for the Panthers. Not a major shock. I think this was a likely or at least a consideration, and even if it didn't happen, we expected him probably to get ramped up rather slowly. Now the difficulty is whether he'll get ramped up slowly once he comes off Pup, because now that puts your... He's the full time starter closer to week six or seven, maybe even later, rather than week four or five. Obviously, this opened things up at the beginning of the season for Chuba Hubbard. How much do you like him and how much does this change your view on Brooks, if at all? Yeah, I mean, it, I think we were probably expecting this. We thought maybe if he had, if he was available, Brooks week one, that would have been a, exceeding expectations in terms of projections and stuff. But the fact that he's going to for sure now miss the first four games. And then we're probably looking at a three or four week ramp up period uh, for him. And 
we're also dealing with a pretty talented backup here who is was the starter most of last year and was the RB9 from week 12 to week 18 uh, for a pretty bad <laughs> Panthers offense. So there's certainly a, there's a few different ways this can go if, uh, if Chuba does well uh, that he could hold on to the starting job all season or for most of the season as they just sort of get Brooks's uh, feet wet uh, as a rookie. Uh, you know, how competitive are the Panthers by week eight or 10? And, you know, do they want to rush him back and or, or not? Um, but they have a week 11 bye. So it's it's feasible that they could use that week 11 by to get him ready to be the, the lead back from week 12 on. Um, and it's also feasible that he comes out of the gates and week five, week six, and, you know, starts to take over the backfield. But it just depends on the talent production difference between him and Chuba. So I would say that Hubbard's a, a, a nice value where he's going. If you need running back production at the start of the year, you're probably going to get, you know, RB2 production out of that spot for the first six or eight weeks. Maybe it's only four, but it could be even longer. Uh, if you're trying, if you're playing like the zero RB game, or you're waiting on somebody to maybe come in at the end, uh, like a Nick Chubb uh, or somebody like that, then that's a good running back to sort of pair with him at a pretty cheap cost. Obviously, tough to assess how ADP will fall out in the next few days if you're drafting right before the season starts. But as of now, Brooks was going in the mid to late eighth. Uh, Hubbard was going in the 12th. So it was very easy to pair those two if you wanted. Obviously, I would expect those two, uh, the gap to close there, Brooks to fall and Hubbard to rise. But that combo is still doable. The Brooks and like a Jerome Ford combo is still doable. And then on the flip side, the Hubbard and someone like Chubb combo is really solid. I agree with you there. Um, I really, really like Jonathan Brooks as a talent. So I do think at some point this year he will win out. It's just a question of when, because if it's week eight, nine, ten, he's probably going to end up on waiver wires before then, I would expect. And so it's it's really hard to hold someone for that long. I'm still drafting him, ideally much later than, or a little bit later at least than the eighth round, somewhere I can stash him for a month, and then hopefully he's back. Because if he is, he could be a league winner down the stretch. Uh, one of the really big ones, injury-wise, well, oh, okay, maybe I shouldn't say that out the gate. I'll ask you if it's a really big one, because a lot of people do think it is. A.J. Dillon went to season-ending IR. This came to as a bit of a surprise to me. I'm not sure whether it was expected across much of the fantasy medical industry, but this opens the door for, A, Marshawn Lloyd, the rookie that they drafted, who is currently dealing with his own injury, or B, some other names there. What is your reaction to this news in terms of Packers backfield fallout? Well, first I want to uh, give a shout out to our injury analyst at D uh, DLF and at 444, Jeff Muller. I uh, was on the uh, Mind of Mansion uh, two-hour podcast yesterday, and uh, the rundown is like war and peace. And one of the questions was, uh, you know, which minor injury in the preseason is going to turn out to be not too minor, or are you worried that it's not minor? And I was like, well, and I couldn't, nothing was springing to mind. So I asked Jeff and he's like, this stinger with AJ Dillon, like there just hasn't been a lot of info on it and necks are really tricky. So I, I'm a little worried about that. So I mentioned that on the podcast yesterday and looked like a genius because about an hour later, <laughs> Dylan, not to laugh at the situation, but I feel bad for Dylan having his season erased. I'm also a Packer fan and he's a good guy. Um, hopefully he can get, his career back on track, uh, get healthy. Uh, but next, you know, it's really dangerous injury for football players, especially. So from a fantasy standpoint, um, the interesting thing I think is that most people are probably listening to this, maybe thought that Lloyd was on pup because there was a report that he's expected to be on pup, but he actually wasn't placed on pup. He's got a hamstring injury. I don't like hamstring injuries for rookies. Uh, so occasionally, uh, maybe it was Odell Beckham who came back from his hamstring injury at the his rookie year and just completely tore it up. But typically, this just sets the the rookies back uh, two months, three months in their development, and they're just not ready to go, you know, by midseason even. So, I would expect him to be the RB two when healthy. I don't know when he'll be healthy. If he was possibly going to go on pup, um, it might be a few games. Emmanuel Wilson right now is the backup. 
uh, for Josh Jacobs, and he's he's actually pretty good. He had he flashed last year, uh, good runner, and it's not it's not uh, rare that we get some of these runners from small schools or kind of unknown, you know, undrafted type players, and they end up doing pretty well. Uh, you can find running backs all shapes and sizes from all over the place. So Wilson is the RB two. He'd be the you know you, I guess you could draft Lloyd as the attrition, but now you're hoping he gets healthy and you're waiting for Jacobs to get dinged up. And, you know, it's just kind of a, a waiting game. I think probably the biggest takeaway from this is that Josh Jacobs is, we don't have to be worried about his workload. I don't think uh, he's probably going to see as much as he can handle with Wilson, you know, spelling him here and there. Yeah. I'm, I bumped Josh Jacobs up after seeing this AJ Dillon, I don't think anyone would argue he's ever been the most efficient running back, the most explosive running back, but he has taken touches over the years very often, including high value touches, goal line stuff from Aaron Jones, who was a very explosive back, more efficient back. He's a rely he has been always a reliable guy that they've given short yardage work to. And not having that in Josh Jacobs back pocket is, I think, big. So Jacobs is now my RB8. I think that's considered wild. I don't know that it really is that wild. We saw him be a top three running back a couple years ago on a worse offense because he just got fed the rock. I think he's going to get fed the rock again. And this is a better offense than that was with the Raiders. If he could get 15 touchdowns, he could get 1,500 yards. I would not be surprised. A couple other quick hitters. TJ Hawkinson went to Pup. I don't think that surprises anybody. I don't think there's much fallout there. Just a note that he is indeed going to miss the first four weeks. I expect he'd miss, he'll miss a few more than that as well. Um, and then Nick Chubb also hit Pup. Again, not surprising. But maybe what was a little more surprising is the running backs cut a couple other running backs. And I believe Naheem Hines went to season-ending IR, if I'm not mistaken. Which leaves Jerome Ford and Pierre Strong. And that is it in the Cleveland backfield right now. So for the first X number of weeks of the season, I'll, I'm curious what you'd expect there. Jerome Ford could be a very, very solid pick. Yeah, I'm looking up uh, Don, uh, Dante Foreman because what I saw was that they were interested in bringing him back uh, either on the practice squad or... Uh, they're they're looking to add another running back later this week, according to uh, I'm trying to see the athletic. So yeah, they really have it, to add someone else. You would expect. Yeah, uh, but it looks like he's third in line after uh, Strong. So and Ford. So yeah, I, I think you 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 know if you want some early season production, Ford is a really solid pick. He's was the fantasy RB fifteen last year, even though his rushing numbers weren't great because he was such a good pass catcher. Um, so certainly fits into this 10th, 11th round, uh, pick where you could get a guy that's going to start the first, uh, half of the season. Very likely. Uh, correction. Hines is the short term IR, so he could come back and maybe catch some passes, but also he might just be a punt returner type guy. I'm not too concerned about him. So yeah, Jerome Ford, really, really solid early in the year. And one could argue or speculate really that this means that they feel good about Chubb's recovery timeline. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's really just speculation. So don't take it with a grain of salt, but that would be nice if you're drafting Chubb or if you have drafted Chubb, maybe we can expect him back a little sooner than later. All righty. Let's hop into this late round goodness. So before we start naming some names, which we will name as many as we can and give some, some brief analysis on most of them, just in terms of strategy, once you get once you're done filling up your lineup, maybe you've drafted a couple of the high high end backups that you really expect to rotate in your flex, and you get into these late rounds. What are you primarily looking to do with these picks? Yeah, when we were coming up with the, the rundown for this podcast, we kind of like what was the cutoff for late rounds or sleepers or whatever, and we just went with double digit rounds, tenth round. So some of these guys are going to be familiar names kind of hot names some of them uh because things really start to dry up later on in the draft as you get yes, into 12 12 to 14 round range but so when we're talking late rounds we're kind of talking 10 through 20 or 12 through 20 or 12 through 18 just depends how big your draft is uh, whether or not you have to draft a kicker and a defense um but what i'm doing is looking at my roster and i'm trying to shore up positions of weakness if i went 
hero RB and my RB2 is Jonathan Brooks and I don't have uh, much going on at the running back position. I'm taking some stabs on some guys that might have some early season production. If I if I have uh, maybe a Jerome Ford or a Chuba Hubbard as my RB2, I might be taking uh, some of these attrition running backs that ha- are one injury away from having a big role. Uh, it's nice to have two to three of those guys on your bench if you can sort of stash them because all of a sudden there's an injury and you've got them and instead of having to bid on them. Uh, if the same thing kind of goes for receiver, if I'm weak at receiver, I'm taking some some guys that look like real world wide receiver two, wide receiver three types that could play or are going to play right away. We just don't know if they're going to produce, but they might be in good situations. Or I might even take a, a wide receiver four, like Dontavian Wicks, for example, who needs just one injury to one of three people to mm-hmm. all of a sudden become a sort of starter for the for the Packers. So you kind of triple your injury odds there if you if you draft a really talented wide receiver four. And those don't you know, guys like that don't come around every day, but there are certainly wide receiver threes that are really talented and you're just sort of looking for an opportunity, injury opportunity if one of those two receivers goes down, who could step in uh, or he, that player could step up and have, uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, usage in the offense. Um, so that's sort of the, the, you know, generally avoiding a second quarterback unless the the roster is pretty big or I want to do a uh, quarterback by committee, which I'm actually doing in one of my leagues. I, I drafted, I got sniped on Jaden Daniels in the ninth round. Somebody took Daniels as their number two uh, running back or quarterback. I think just to spite me because they, they follow me and they know that I wanted them, but <laughs> it's department. a six point, pa- it's a six point pass TD league and I got Brock Purdy. And then the next round I got Jared Goff. So I'm going to do the Goff gambit, start him at oh, home. Yeah. And then run Purdy out there uh, for his road games for most of them anyway. Uh, generally avoiding the second quarterback unless you know your league. Like, take a look at your league. Uh, what's the history of quarterbacks on the waiver wire? Do people generally have two quarterbacks? Uh, if they do, you might want to have one because there's not going to be a lot available on the waiver wire uh, in that type of league. Uh, same kind of same thing kind of goes with tight ends. Whether or not you want to have a backup there, it sort of depends on what's available in the waiver wire in your in your league. Uh, and then I'm trying to wait as long as possible on kicker and defense. I don't usually take them first or in the top six. You know, I'm not one of the first six teams usually to get a defense or a kicker. Um, one of the last ones usually. And I don't necessarily go wait till the very final rounds because then you're really looking at the b- bottom of the barrel. But maybe. Second to last round, third to last round, I'm, I'm picking up my kicker in defense and I can usually get who I want from a value standpoint. What about you? Um, largely similar. I think the most important thing you said or the, or the thing that I like the most from what you said is that in to a degree, it depends on how you started or what you have on your roster leading into these rounds. Because a lot of the times you'll you'll you know just hear a general strategy and that's not necessarily as valuable as looking at your team, looking at what you have, and where you're solid versus where you're not, and then making picks based off of that. And I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but it's like if you are very solid at running back, if you took two early on, you probably don't need to grab a guy like, a you know, Jerome Ford is not quite going in these sleeper ranges, but these guys, maybe a Gus Edwards even, who's reliable but not that exciting. You have the... Um, opportunity and the luxury i would say even of going after the big hit guys who either could take the job somehow or who could like you mentioned be one injury away from having that job and now you have a bunch of stars same thing as at receiver if you took a couple you know if you took a couple rookies if you took marvin harrison and malik neighbors and then you get to the double digit rounds i might be more interested in going someone like joshua palmer Versus someone like Dontavian Wicks, because they might take the rookies a little time to ramp up. We it's their riskier picks, even though we really like them as prospects. And so you get to these double digit rounds, and you can find a guy. Okay, I think Joshua Palmer is probably going to be the top target or one of the top targets on his team. He should be relatively rel- reliable, but I don't expect it to be a wide receiver one. I just want him to fill the gap while my wide receiver one rookies kind of gear into that position. Whereas if you take a couple stars off, off the gate, then you could pick up a guy like Dontavian Wicks or uh, one of the deeper rookies uh, at wide receiver. Somebody that 
I'll name one from the Patriots later, spoiler alert, Ortiz, uh, that I really like that could end up being at least their team's wide receiver one and maybe a fantasy wide receiver two. Um, so look at your roster, know what you have, pick based off that. I will also say, generally speaking, once the holes are filled or supported, once you've got some sandbags in those weak spots, if you have any, I'm targeting upside more than anything else. I don't want like a, in years past, arguably, you know, he had one really good year, but like a Hunter Renfro type player. I don't really want that in the 14th round. I want a guy who is going to have a chance to break out from nowhere, be a Puka Nakua. Obviously, that's an extreme example. But give me starting many, many starting weeks rather than just being a flex uh, hole filler. I think you can t- t- find those on waivers quite often. And the other nice thing about these late round picks, if you're going for upside, is you'll probably know pretty quick whether or not they're going to be anything. A great example is the Bills wide receivers, who I imagine we'll talk about in a bit. We'll probably know within the first few weeks who's getting the major target share there and who we can expect to be good. Obviously, that can change a little bit over the season. But what that means is that if you pick a guy in the 14th round and he's getting three targets a week and the other guy in that offense is getting seven or eight, you can just drop him and move on and pick someone up off waivers and not feel bad. And so I like targeting the upside where it's either going to be a boom or a bust. And then waiver wires will end up filling in all those holes. Very, very likely, more commonly than not, this is just the way that things work in fantasy. The majority of the players you pick in these rounds will be off your roster within a couple months, if not by the end of the season. You're just looking for those hits that will stay and will be stars down the stretch. So I think that's what you're aiming for in this range. Uh Let's hit on some of them. We've got uh, half the podcast and name names. Who who's your number one? If maybe not your number one overall <laughs> sleeper pick, but who's the name that you, yeah, that what, you're thinking about? Should we? Uh, maybe we should go by position. Let's just sure. talk a little bit about the QB twos to start. Um, yeah, you know, good. I think uh, if you're looking at the tenth round, you can get a, a, a Trevor Lawrence, a Jared Goff, a Tua. Uh, so. If you if you're interested in my take on them, check out my thread that I posted on Twitter I yesterday. Um, they're they're really solid and can post low end QB one mid range QB one numbers certainly for a stretch, perhaps the whole season. Um, so there's lo- there's just good receiving options there, good offenses for the most part. Geno Smith, as you get into the twenties, uh, he's int- intriguing from a QB2 super flex standpoint, maybe backup standpoint because of the new offense with Ryan Grubb. He obviously has a good receiving core there with uh, DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett and Jackson Smith and Jigba. And are there even, there's even some buzz about Noah Fant, although I'm not really buying it. I think that offense could be good. Uh, Will Levis is in- intriguing from a volume standpoint because uh, I think their pass splits, total pass attempts really rises now. Derrick Henry's gone. They got the offensive coordinator uh i think from cincy right we're one of the yep. heavy Callahan. heavy uh heavy pass heaviest passing offenses in the league last few years cincinnati uh and he's got a pretty good receiving core too if hopkins is healthy and it looks like he will be back for week one uh and then i'm kind of in like interested to see how sam darrell does for the vikings i'm, I'm pretty anti minnesota vikings as a packer fan but he uh, has shown some competency in his last couple, three years as getting his spot starts here and there. His last stint for Carolina was pretty good. I think he was over eight, eight uh, yards per attempt. He runs the ball, uh, can get rushing touchdowns as well. Obviously, he's got Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, um, uh, Aaron uh, Jones there catching passes out of the backfield as well. And at some point, he'll get uh, Hawkinson back. Uh, So he's, I mean, he's bottom of the barrel in terms of his ADP, but I think he's a pretty intriguing QB three in uh, super flex formats. Uh, I really like the Will Levis call as well for the rushing upside. I think that that sometimes gets a little overlooked. He he should be a, a pretty valuable rushing quarterback, and then he will sling the ball. If you... Check your settings if you have any interception uh, oddities in your scoring. <laughs> it's worth noting with Levis because he'll probably be up there in interceptions. But um, I really, really like Tua in the 10th round if you're looking for either if 
you passed on all the quarterbacks and someone started taking their quarterback two and you still don't have one and you really want a quarterback one, I think two is maybe the best bet outside of those top 12 guys to be a, a solid startable every week quarterback one. As you mentioned with a couple guys, the receiving core, you can't get much better than Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle off the top. Um, and they've even filled it out a little bit more. Odell Beckham Jr. will take some time to get healthy, but when he's there, we've seen him even at his in his elderly years with the Rams show some ability as a wide receiver three. Jonu Smith, obviously who we both like, probably a better, more productive tight end than what he's had recently. Um, and I, I think the news out of camp has been really good on him. Uh, Tyree Kill has been raving about him. I think he continues to progress. His deep ball supposedly is getting better. So I like Tua. He's the last guy I'd really be happy about getting as my QB1. And if you get him as your high-end QB2, then that's just incredible. Obviously, I will shout out my old immobile uh, veterans in Kirk Cousins, Aaron Rodgers, and Matthew Stafford. If you listen to our Bold prediction show with Kendall Valenzuela, you know that I'm in on these guys. If you didn't, you should go check that out. But I just believe that these guys are good quarterbacks who have not lost their talent by any means. And... Uh, in varying cases between the three of them, have the supporting cast and the offense around them to con- to still be good. Kirk Cousins obviously loses Justin Jefferson, but has some great pass catchers in Atlanta that we like for fantasy that are being drafted well for fantasy, uh, including Bijan and Kyle Pitts. Aaron Rodgers had Gar- has Garrett Wilson. He has Brees Hall. He will have Mike Williams when he's healthy, which is a very solid wide receiver too. I think is getting overlooked. And is just a great, great quarterback. I know the last year in Green Bay wasn't good. I think that was more of a chicken and the egg thing with his receivers uh, who have continued to develop and they've continued to add. So now Green Bay has a great receiving core. But back in Rodgers' last years, it was not pretty. And then Matthew Stafford has arguably two top 12 wide receivers. It could certainly pan out that way. Even if it doesn't, guys who are getting drafted as two 20, top 20 wide receivers in Puka and Cooper Cup, as well as Kyron Williams, who's a great pass catcher. That offense is going to be great. It always is under Sean McVay. Stafford has been very good in stretches. I think all three of these guys are very, very solid QB2s, like the ideal kind of QB2, in my opinion, um, who are just going to give you a, a nice, solid floor and let your starter hit the upside. Or... At least one of them, if not all three of them, as my bold prediction would suggest, will be QB1. So I really like those guys. And then I like some of the names you mentioned, but I'll also throw out, and this one's pretty yucky, Bryce Young. I like Bryce Young as a QB2 target. You're not taking him as a in a QB1 league unless, like you mentioned, it's very deep and you're looking for a backup. Because he could break out. But even if... Even if you're in a, or more particularly if you're in a 2QB league, with the arrival of Dave Canales and what he has done for quarterbacks these last couple years with Geno Smith and Baker Mayfield, the fact that Bryce Young was the number one pick, I liked him a lot as a prospect. I still believe in him. I believe he's very accurate. His receiving core has been vastly upgraded, primarily with the addition of Deontay Johnson, which is huge. I know that Deontay Johnson is not like the true elite wide receiver one that we might prefer to have for our quarterback, like a Tyree kill, like a CD lamb. He is not that, but what he is is very good at getting open and giving a quarterback a nice target to hit. So I like that addition. The offensive line was vastly upgraded. You've talked about that in some of our podcasts. So I think Bryce young is being just thrown to the curb, absolutely dumpstered after his rookie season, which was awful enough to deserve that to some degree, but because of how much has changed, we need to be willing to look at how much has changed and say, I expect this could be different. I do expect it could be different. I think he will be a QB2, and I think he could sneak his way up into upper QB2, maybe even fringe QB1 range, which gives you a great value where he's going in drafts. Can I comment? I actually have comments about a lot of the players you said. This yeah, is, yeah. This is actually not negative necessarily. Maybe some of them are, but the Bryce Young going <laughs> QB twenty seven right now. He's going after Derek Carr, um, which and Bo Nix. Uh, Absurd. Yeah, we also didn't mention uh, Baker Mayfield, who is he was a top mm-hmm. ten quarterback last year. Yeah, uh, and still has pretty much everything back except for Dave Canales, 
which is another reason to like Bryce Young. So he's getting his offensive lines better. He's got Deontay Johnson now, and he's got a much better offensive mind who has gotten really good fantasy seasons out of Baker Mayfield and uh, Geno Smith in the last two seasons. So there is a reason to be kind of bullish on him as a QB3. Maybe he gets into those QB2 numbers uh, this year. Um, Tua, I agreed with everything you said. I just wanted to point out with that. He has a pretty nice schedule. Uh, he's got a bye in week six. And then you just got to be prepared. Uh, week 14, he has the Jets. Uh, week 16, he has San Francisco. Those Both those games are at home, so maybe okay. But these are two of the better defenses. And then week 17 mm-hmm. is at Cleveland, which could be really ugly if the wind is Ooh. whistling at that point. So if you do draft Tua, just be prepared that you might want to midseason start to look at the 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 waiver wire and pick out a quarterback that has good matchups that week that you could plug in because once you get to those weeks, everybody's going to be looking for that and you have to compete with that. So I just wanted to mention that. And then on your, I could see the bull case on the old guys here, you know, Kirk cousins, you know, low end QB one numbers, his entire career. Rogers obviously was a fantasy star for most of his career has a really should be a really improved offensive line for the jets. That's the one thing that's kind of being under, sold there is how much they just revamped it and plus he's got a pretty good receiving core and then matthew stafford as you mentioned i think the concern here with all these guys is just that they're old and that they're gonna get dinged up and that's why they're going where they're going and that's that to me is when when you said they're all gonna they're all gonna be quarterback ones they all have to stay (laughs) healthy for the entire season and i would bet big money that they don't i mean stafford is already dealing with a uh, hamstring injury in camp and like so these are the guys that i agree that uh you know when they're healthy and going that they're gonna they're definitely a threat to to post uh qb1 numbers so i think that covered pretty much everybody you're t- i just wanted to comment on those guys and just bring a little bit of extra context just one name that we haven't touched on briefly deshaun watson are we at this point saying he's never getting it back he's <laughs> lost it all well, camp hasn't gone well, right? Uh, no. Nope. The, the last beat reporter uh, report I read was like the passing game is in trouble. It doesn't look good. Yeah. Uh, I've just been out on him since I yeah. first saw him there in Cleveland. Like it's just not, it's, it's everything seems to be broken. I think Amari Cooper will get there, and I think Njoku will get there just based on volume. Um, but I'm you know I don't think these peripheral guys are going to do much. What a loss it was really good early on, but all right. Let's move on to running back. This is going to be, oh, I think we'll have to uh, rapid fire a lot of the names that are backups, but then there are some, some other guys as well who maybe could just contribute without an injury in front of them. But as you mentioned early on in the show, that is really what we're targeting here and more at this position than any other, because this is a position where if the guy in front of them goes down and you have a solid backup who can take over the number one role, all of a sudden you have a RB2 or an RB1, depending on the offense out of completely nowhere so who are some of your favorite targets in either of those uh archetypes yeah if, if you're talking just here you know guys that can start early in the season we've talked about it hubbard and ford i think in the 10th 11th round 12th round i got i just picked up hubbard in my keeper league in the 12th round as my rb2 uh living the the risky life there um but we'll see i think he should be good for the half of the season same same goes for ford um, and then you get into these guys and it's just a big long list and there isn't a whole lot of necessarily analysis here. It's these yep. guys are second on the death chart and yep. the guys that, that I like to try to target are have a low ADP. Um, they're talent. We know they're talented and if they're in a good offense, that's a plus if they're behind a running back, that's got an injury history, uh, a long injury history, that's a plus as well. So the guy that kind of springs to mind there is Ty Chandler. Um, because of Aaron Jones's injury history, and also they just might give him a week Chandler. They might give him a weekly role where you could plug him in as a, a flex if you needed to, and you don't just have to wait for an injury to happen with him. But I'll just run down the list here. Blake Corum, uh, behind Kyron Williams, has obviously got a ton of upside, but he's you know he's going tenth, eleventh round. Uh, Julio McLaughlin, Trey Benson, uh, Zach Charbonnet, uh, Tyler Algier. Ty Chandler, Khalil Herbert, J.K. Dobbins, uh, Jordan Mason uh, with the Elijah Mitchell on IR for the season now. The way is clear for him to be the RB2 behind 
CMC, uh, and he might he might he was really productive last year. He might see a, a weekly role as well. Ray Davis playing behind James Cook, Rico Dowdle fighting for snaps with Ezekiel Elliott, Tyron Tracy, uh, Antonio Gibson, Bucky Irving, uh, Emmanuel Wilson right now as the RB two for the uh, for the Packers, um, Braylon Allen, Damian Pierce, Jalen Wright, who is really the RB three, but if he's one of those yep. guys that if either Achan or Mostert goes down, all of a sudden you have a starter probably in Jalen Wright, Tank Bigsby, and Carson Steele, and so just FYI, from a ranking standpoint, with Jalen Wright, it's really hard to rank an RB three very high in the projections because I'm, you know, I'm assuming that the Achan and Mostert are going to play most of the season, so it's hard to give many stats or have him ranked Jalen Wright ranked really high. So if you're sitting there at the end of your draft and you're looking at, you know, a, a guy to grab, don't necessarily go off the projections and take the highest guy that's there. You might want to just go ahead and go down that list and take Jalen Wright because he has that upside that you were talking about, Matt. Yeah, I would I would assume, and you tell me if I'm wrong on this, but in these rounds, projections really does become much less relevant because your your whole hope in these rounds is that you find someone who annihilates the projections entirely by some opportunity opening up or some talent flashing. And you're getting something that you never expected or that you didn't project. Yeah. And I, I would say, like, just looking at the list, like who's playing behind, you know, injury prone or injury history type running backs. Trey Benson jumps out, uh, Jaleel McLaughlin. But those guys are got, kind of going early relative to this to this crew. Khalil Herbert's kind of flying under the radar with DeAndre Swift ahead of him. And he's a good runner. He, he ran well last year. He's a, he's a good runner. Uh, and Dowdle. You know, and it would be a if he ends up winning that job, or if Zeke, you know, at his age, advanced age, goes down, he would be a you know a pretty big uh, spike in terms of touches and production. Yeah. Um, of the uh, of the names you mentioned, some of the ones that stand out to me, Corum for sure. Obviously, the, there's a reason he's going higher than almost everyone else you mentioned. Really, at that tenth or eleventh round mark, and that's because. It is a very good chance that he does have opportunity even without a Kyron Williams injury. But if Kyron Williams goes down, this is a guy who has been a workhorse back for very good offenses, scored a ton of touchdowns in college, and has shown the talent to be a number one. And in a Sean McVay system, if you can get the majority, the vast majority of the work, you are going to be an RB1. Blake Corm is one of the guys where if Kyron goes down, I would bet on him being an RB1 for fantasy, not just say it's possible, but bet on it. So that one's huge. Um, really like that. Tyler Algier is probably the most, like the biggest gap between how good he can be versus how boring the name is. Because we don't even want to think about the guys behind our Bijan Robinsons, really, because <laughs> please, Bijan, don't go down. But Algier has been very, very solid filling in uh, either as as a backup or just taking carries. And there was that report, obviously, that these guys would split carries pretty significantly. I don't think it'll be quite the numbers that that tweet said. I think it was like 17 carries and 14 carries a game or something like that between the two of them. I don't expect Tyler Giro to see mid-double-digit carries, but he's a guy who could be flexible in some games, even without an injury to Bijan. But if that happens, he's a huge, huge upside guy. I really like taking J.K. Dobbins because he's one of the ones that doesn't necessarily need an injury. What he needs is to get healthy himself, and that's very, very tall ask because obviously many, many years of injury history and coming currently off an Achilles, which is really tough for a running back. But if by some miracle he gets healthy, he has been one of the best, most explosive, efficient runners when he's been on the field for those very, very short stints in his career. I could easily see him overtaking the RB1 job in Los Angeles over Gus Edwards, or at least being like a 1A to Edwards' 1B. And if Edwards goes down for some reason and Dobbins does get healthy, now you're the number one with talent in an offense that we expect to run the ball a lot. That one's huge. Uh, and then Ray Davis is probably my favorite. I also really like Jalen Wright because, as you mentioned, there's multiple opportunities. So there's multiple guys who could get injured to give Jalen Wright an opportunity. And both of them have dealt with some injuries. So I do like the Jalen Wright call also just very explosive, but Ray Davis is probably my number one favorite target. Um, we, when we had Kendall on the show, 
she was talking about rookie running backs in these late rounds that she wanted to target and tried to avoid Ray Davis because she really likes James Cook. I don't have those qualms at all. A, I don't think James Cook is cut out to be an every down workhorse back. And I think that Buffalo has shown us that and told us that pretty clearly. I think that they want a guy who they can give some change of pace work, give some short yardage work, maybe give some goal line work. And Ray Davis, to me, is that guy. Very talented. And the size is much more attractive for that role. He weighs 30 pounds more than James Cook, but is three inches shorter. That is a vast difference in BMI that is very, very attractive for those kinds of uh, opportunities that James Cook maybe isn't as well suited for. So I think Ray Davis could get work that is potentially viable, even with James Cook not being injured. But if he goes down, again, you have a great offense, you have a guy with talent, and you have a lot of opportunities. So I really, really like targeting him. He's in the 16th round. So that's basically your last pick or last pick besides kicker and defense in many, many leagues. I love targeting him. A couple other notes. Uh, I think Algier just has that uh, Arthur Smith stink on him. True. Still. The stank. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, I, I want to mention Carson Steele because Daenerys Prince got cut. Uh, mm. Clyde, Clyde oh, Edwards Hilaire is dealing with some, uh, I don't know what the word was. It was like, uh, it was like psychology or, uh, mental stress or something along those lines, which could result in some time away from the team if things aren't straightened out quickly for him. So, you know, rooting for him in terms of getting that together, mental health. Um, so Carson Steele has obviously buzzed up the, <laughs> The draft boards, uh, especially with the yep. fantasy football community, analyst community, uh, back up there for Isaiah Pacheco and uh, Kamani Vidal. Uh, is we were just talking about Dobbins. So if if you if you are gonna fade Dobbins uh, Achilles, like Dobbins to me, obviously when healthy, very talented running back. We saw that early in his career. From what I've seen and what I've read, he looks like he is quote unquote back. I don't know if that will remain uh the case because the just the history of the Achilles is is long and ugly. Uh but there's a chance that perhaps his is better or his recovery is better and he is ready to go because it did look does look like he's got a lot of quickness in the in the camp uh highlights that I've seen. And you know if he's fully healthy he's a probably better more upsidey type player than Gus Edwards. Uh, if you are not a believer and want to just go with the the numbers and the trends, which I would usually do, uh, and just bet against Dobbins, then Vidal is the one that could seriously capitalize uh, on his absence or just ineffectiveness as you know coming off that Achilles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, wide receivers. There's a bunch of them as well. Uh, who stands out to you? I think I know who the number one is. I don't know, I don't know who the number two is, for that matter. It's always Josh Palmer and Car- Curtis Samuel. Sometimes yep. it's Curtis Samuel and then Josh Palmer, but uh, Curtis Samuel's yeah. got that toe injury, so I think he uh, is iffy for week one. I'm not worried about that. I'm going to need him You know, when the bye weeks roll around, week four, week five. I love the idea of him playing with Josh uh, Allen with all those targets up for grabs. And Buffalo Palmer, I've uh, gone over him a bunch of times, just – has been great with uh, Mike Williams sidelined. And now that Mike Williams is out of the way, Keenan Allen's out of the way, he's, he should see a boatload of targets there from Justin Herbert. Rashid Shahid has been dealing with an injury, but he obviously had a very promising season last year. Uh, should see a higher snap share. I think he was in the 60% range, should be closer to 70 or 80 this year as a full-time starter uh, with Michael Thomas out of the way and all that. Dontavian Wicks discussed him before wide receiver four, probably the best wide receiver four in the league. I also like Bo Melton yep. for that matter, wide receiver five. Uh, and then it's just some interesting guys as you get deeper and deeper. I've been drafting a little bit of Michael Wilson uh, as the number two option, but Greg Dorch is another interesting guy. I know you want to talk about him, but this passing attack uh, for the Cardinals should be good. The, the, the defense isn't going to be very good. So lots of shootouts, lots of stats available there. Uh, I'm coming. I'm back, back in a little bit on Rashad Bateman at this price. Uh, you know, I'm not Ooh. a huge, huge believer in Zay Flowers being the alpha that they need there. And Bateman, they've cleared the path for him, and he has had uh, a good camp. But uh, you know, I, I, I googled it. Uh, he's had a good camp, and they're looking <laughs> for him to maybe have a comeback. I think he's 
uh, you know, from a route running standpoint, he was a big favorite of uh, Matt Harmon. I think Matt's probably off of him at this point. He's been burned a few times, but they're actually pretty excited about him. Uh, Demarcus Robinson as the wide receiver three for the Rams. Your your boy Stafford. Any sort of injury to Puka or Cup, which is not unheard of. Uh, he cool. steps into a little bit bigger role. I think just as a wide receiver three, he's good for five for 50. He's had, had some big games uh, last year in that role. I, I, he's not being, uh, he's nobody's drafting him or he's always available. Andre is, is, is those, oh, I had this down. Yoshivas. I, Yosh, Yoshivas. I looked Yoshivas. it up and it was actually, it's something, yeah, it's it's something weird. Um, yep. Andre Yoshivas, uh, yep. wide receiver three for the, for the Bengals. Uh, Looks like he's ahead of the rookie there, and uh, T. Higgins and Jamar Chase are going to draw a lot of the attention there. And you know, I don't know how much they're going to run it with Zach Moss and Chase Brown. Malik Washington looks like he's going to be the start the season as a wide receiver three with Odell Beckham sidelined uh, with injury. We really don't know his status. If there were any injury to Waddle or Tyree Kill, then all of a sudden Malik Washington might be in the wide receiver two role. I'm interested to see who the number two receiver is for the uh, commanders. Diami Brown is seems to be the, I don't know if he's going to pan out, but uh, with Jahan Dotson moving on, we've got a wide open uh, depth chart there behind Terry McLaurin. So those are the guys I'm kind of taking dart throws on the final few rounds of the draft, just to try to give myself uh, some upside there, you know, an injury here or just some, especially in best ball, just like some guys that are going to be on the field as wide receiver threes that might pop in, in any given week. Yeah. And a really good off the top example of what we were talking about earlier is like the Josh Palmer versus Rashid Shahid question. Rashid Shahid, in my opinion, is either going to burst onto the scene, be the true number two in this offense and be very, very, very useful for fantasy, or he's going to be a once every four weeks, best ball guy. And that doesn't work in redraft and we can get rid of him. So this is a good example of if you started off really, really strong at wide receiver, grab Rashid Shahid, and now you have a guy that if he, you know, hits, now you have three great receivers or four. If you started off a little riskier or a little shallower receiver, Josh Palmer is such, in my opinion, such a safe pick who's going to get a lot of targets in that offense and be solid. Love those. Uh, the Michael Wilson call out. What, the first thing I'll say is, in case you're still out on Kyler Murray, stop it. Because Michael Wilson made John John's list and Greg Dortch made my list. And these are the guys that come after the most highly touted rookie in history and Trey McBride as the two top targets and James Conner, who's a good pass catcher. So good for goodness sake, draft Kyler Murray. But yeah, I do like Greg Dortch. I will say Michael Wilson has a better chance to like become a wide receiver, a consistent wide receiver, like high end wide receiver two type guy. He fits that role a little bit more. That would probably require Marvin Harrison to not be who he we expect him to be or to get injured. Greg Dorch is a little bit let a little bit more of a flash pan, not as reliable type of guy, potentially, though I think he has a better upside if uh Marvin Harrison stays healthy and is what we expect because he plays a very different role. I do expect that it will be Harrison and Wilson on the outside and then Dorch probably in the slot for a lot of the time. There is no more Rondale Moore here, which is the role that Dorch plays really well and kind of filled in for when Rondale Moore missed time. And he's shown a bunch of flashes when given the opportunity. He's a popular sleeper pick, Greg Dorch is. Um, so, but he's still not going high. 21st round. This is the last pick your draft kind of guy who, if he does hit, could flash and be that wide receiver too in terms of fantasy production for the Cardinals. I will then throw out Khalil Shakir. I think for most of this offseason, uh, you have been touting Curtis Samuel and and poo-pooing Khalil Shakir. Um, well, neither of us have really been on Keon Coleman that much. But somebody here, at least one somebody, maybe two somebodies, is going to be good in this wide receiver core for Buffalo. And I do think, and I said this, I believe when I drafted Curtis Samuel in our mock draft with Mike Wright, it's anyone who says they know for sure I think is tripping because it's so hard to tell what's going to happen in Buffalo. Is it going to be primarily a um, looking for the prototypical one? In that case, it's probably going to be Coleman. Is it going to be the most versatile guy who has the longest uh, history of success? 
Then it's going to be Curtis Samuel. Is it going to be the guy that maybe has the most rapport with Josh Allen coming into camp? Then it's probably going to be Khalil Shakir because he was here last year and the other guys weren't. And he has talked about how he likes Khalil Shakir. Also, over the latter half of last year when Joe Brady took over, Shakir was very good. He led the team in receiving yards when Brady was the offensive coordinator uh, midway through the season. Uh, he had, in the last three games, he had a six catch for 105-yard performance in Week 18. And then in the two playoff games, he had 12 targets, 10 catches, 75 yards, and two touchdowns. There's been a lot of good hype out of camp that he's always open. I like Curtis Samuel as a known commodity, but I think that because we know what he is, I don't expect him to be a wide receiver one or even a like mid to high end wide receiver two. So this is another one of those good examples. If you want a Josh Palmer type guy, a guy you can flex off, and I think Curtis Samuel might be the better pick in this range. But if you want a guy who maybe could break out to be Josh Allen's wide receiver one, I think it's Khalil Shakir. I think Keon Coma will get his touchdowns, but I prefer the guy who can get open, just generally speaking, when I'm evaluating wide receivers versus the guy who's the jump ball player. And Shakir is the guy who can get open. Uh, so I like him. I don't disagree, but this is a weird situation. The uh, Shakir did have a really good yards per route run uh, last year, 1.84, which was pretty solid. Uh, the reason I reason Coleman is intriguing is that his basically his preseason snaps he's playing like every down with josh allen yeah. and obviously they want to get him get him together and get the rapport going uh, he has not been super successful in the preseason um but no. if he's out there if he's out there playing 90 percent of the snaps then i think i don't think he's just going to be running wind sprints uh yep. the, the number the numbers are going to come but i so i don't know what shakir's role will be when Samuel's back and who's who's kind of the odd man out in terms of snaps, because you would think that they would want to have they love Dawson Knox as the inline tight end and they gotta have Kincaid on the field a lot. So you'd of think course. that they're gonna be in a lot of twelve and who's gonna be the odd man out. I wouldn't I would hope it's not Shakir for your for your sake. And if he's out playing Coleman, it might be Shakir and Samuel. I think Samuel is the safest bet of this of these three because of his veteran status and his history with this offensive coordinator who got a wide receiver 25 finish out of him, fantasy wide receiver 25, low end wide receiver two, high end wide receiver three. And he was the third option uh, in Carolina with Teddy Bridgewater at quarterback. So <laughs> I think there's upside for him into those, you know, solid wide receiver two type numbers if he can get healthy. Um, and he's playing what we would hope he would play as the number quote unquote number one option. Uh, so that's the bull case for for Curtis Samuel. Plus, he runs the ball a little bit as well. They might hand True. him the ball twice a game. Uh, he's pretty good in that role as well. I could see the case for Shakir for sure. I think the the thing with I think people are excited about Coleman. Those that are excited are excited about the fact that he's the shiny new toy. And yep. he's stepping into a huge target opportunity with a really good quarterback. Yeah. Which is worth rem reminding, like with Diggs and Gabe Davis gone, there's room for two of these guys to be decent, uh, if not very good. So maybe we're both right here. I will also throw out one more. One other name is Jalen Polk. Despite what I just said about not really liking the jump ball guy who doesn't get open super well, I prefer the other guy. I don't know that there is the other guy in New England. They have a bunch of wide receiver fours and Jalen Polk and Javon Baker as well, who they both took in this last draft class. But Polk was the guy that took at the top of the second round. He looked very good at Washington last year. He has unbelievable hands and is a great catch point guy. You're hoping that he is a Mike Evans type player. And uh, like I said, I do prefer the receivers who can get open. But if there's not one of those guys in New England, which really don't know that there is, then you're going to be looking to the the best possible option, the big, easy to, to target, uh, safe to target because he will come down with the ball kind of guy who can score touchdowns. And I think Jalen Polk could be that guy. We still haven't heard a starter named, at least as of this morning, uh, but I expect it to be Drake May at this point, following the coach speak a little bit, which has admittedly been confusing. If it is, I, I like Drake May, or I like Drake May, and that makes me like um, Jalen Polk even more. So he's a fun one, deep in this range that has the ability to be his team's wide receiver one, which would make him valuable for fantasy. 
Yeah, Polk is uh, also a good route runner, according to Matt Harmon. So he was kind of high on my list for a while, and then and he was actually doing well in camp. And then it kind of came out that he was the four wide receiver four, not starting wide receiver three, wide receiver four. Uh, going on with Matt Kelly yesterday, he really likes Demario Douglas. Um, okay, wow. uh, you know, so we'll see. He's a Patriots fan, so he knows him pretty well, and he did have a pretty good season last year in spots. But I think yeah. you might see at the start of the year that it's Douglas, Polk, and Osborne as the starting receivers there. And if Drake May and turns out to be decent, then one of these guys uh, might might pop. Um, Kedrick Bourne is on pup. If he were healthy, fully healthy, and hadn't had what it torn his ACL, right, uh, or something, was it his knee? I think. Yeah. So I it was his knee. Yeah. I think it was his knee. Sorry if I'm incorrect, but Bourne has always been a guy when he gets 70, 80 percent of the snap, he ends up producing. Yeah, and most of these guys, and this is kind of to my point, feel like good wide receiver threes, wide receiver twos. They, I agree they're talented, but I don't see DeMario Douglas being a true wide receiver one. I don't see Kendrick Bourne by any stretch being a true wide receiver one. They can be helpful for the Patriots, I agree. Yeah. But the only guy in this in this crew that I can see being a true wide receiver one is Jalen Polk, which is why he's the one I'd be targeting. All right, let's hit the tight ends. Uh, we've hit on a few of these guys before because some of them are our favorite sleepers overall. Uh, who are you, who are you looking for? Yeah. I mean, Taysom Hill is uh, kind of a no brainer at this point, given the way his preseason usage is over 60% of the snaps. Uh, he played about 37% of the snaps last year and finished in the top 10 in standard formats and half PPR, a little lower in full PPR. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if you're in full PPR, he doesn't have quite as much value because he doesn't catch a lot of passes for a tight end, but he does everything else. Uh, people just are trying to ignore him on draft day, but he's he's definitely worthwhile as a tight end too. Or if you want to just fully fade the position and grab him as your tight end one, I think that's actually doable this year. Uh, Double John check Smith, your format, make sure he's got yeah. tight end eligibility, but then do Yeah, it. certainly before you draft him as your tight end, you better make sure he <laughs> can play tight end for you. Uh, John New Smith, um, I've been talking about him a lot. Great athletic weapon for Mike McDaniel. Uh, also, that Beckham injury might open up a few targets for him as well, if it's not Malik Washington getting that whole role. Tyler Conklin is interesting uh, as the tight end for uh, Aaron Rodgers. Had a good season last year. Should uh, be even better this year with a better passing attack, and he should be able to run more routes with the offensive line being a little bit better. Uh, he played a lot of snaps last year, clear number one. And then Hunter Henry is kind of interesting now with Drake May perhaps uh, winning that job. Uh, Henry has posted low end tight end one, high end tight end two type numbers since he's come over to the Patriots. And he's, he's you know, we, there was a year, there was a time in, in our fantasy lives where we were excited about drafting Hunter Henry when he was playing for the, <laughs> I remember. the Chargers, right? So uh, he's, he's you know, going pretty late, 14th, 15th round. I think he's a really solid tight end too. We've hit on Taysom and Jonu a ton, so I don't have to back you up there. You know that I like those picks. I will throw in on the Tyler Conklin thing. I love that call as a late sleeper pick. If you want to see some wildly consistent numbers, go look up Tyler Conklin pro football reference. He has had 87 targets in three straight years, exactly 87, right around 60 catches, right around 600 yards. He hasn't hit the touchdowns, but he hasn't had Aaron Rodgers at quarterback. Yeah. So if Aaron Rodgers comes in and hits him for six touchdowns, all of a sudden you have a tight end one with those numbers. So I really like that. That is like one of the sneakiest sleeper picks that I think could be really solidly consistent. I guarantee you we will be streaming Tyler Conklin at various points this year. He will make waiver wire and streaming articles. The other names I'll throw out, Pat Fryermuth, I have hit on a ton this offseason. If you've been listening to this podcast, you know he's my favorite target at tight end. Once you get outside like the top six in the Arthur Smith offense that loves targeting a tight end position, assuming there's no one good enough behind him that Smith can foolishly target the wrong guy. I think that is the, that is the case here. I don't believe in Darnell Washington. Um, and Fryermuth scored seven touchdowns as a rookie with the husk of Ben Roethlisberger. I think that whether it's Wilson or Fields, which we still don't know as of this podcast, these two teams are the ones we don't know. Uh, Steelers and Patriots, either one will be better than what Fryer Ruth has had. And I don't, I like George Pickens, but I don't see him being the type of guy who draws 150 targets, which as a wide receiver one, which means there's going to be a lot of targets available for Pat Fryer Ruth, possibly as a number two in this, in this system, in this offense. So I really like him. Uh, to your previous question about 
who will be the wide receiver two in Washington behind Terry McLaurin? The answer is Ben Sennett, the rookie tight end. Uh, at least that's what I think. It's it's a stretch because he's a rookie, and I'll admit that the tight end position and rookie um, doesn't mix well or hasn't over the, the past, you know, ever. Except for very, very recently when we've seen it start to be viable. He is unbelievably athletic. 6'4", 250. 40 inch vertical, 10 foot, 6 inch broad jump, and a 6'8'2 three cone drill. If you don't know what that means, it's absurd for someone of that size and a tight end to run a 6'8'2 three cone drill. It means he is quick, athletic, he can get in and out of breaks. I think he's going to get open a ton. He is going to be a great pass catching tight end at some point in his career. I think it could happen right off the bat, given the fact that they don't have a true solid number two, like you mentioned, behind Terry McLaurin. I honestly believe it could be Senate. And then one other really, really deep name I'll throw out, Greg Dulcich. The one maybe piece of fallout from Tim Patrick being gone and we expect him, expected him maybe to have won the wide receiver two job is that there are targets available behind Cortland Sutton, possibly touchdowns available. Uh, Bo Nix, as the Drew Brees successor in the Sean Payton system, I like the tight end in that kind of opportunity. And Greg Dulcich has flashed when he's been healthy, which admittedly has been very, very rare in his short career. But if he's healthy and he is Sean Payton and Bo Nix's tight end, I really like that opportunity. So he's someone that I'd grab in as a, a backup tight end or in a really deep league that maybe could see tight end one numbers before the year is out. Yeah, I want to throw a couple of responses at you. Sinet was has been was in my top twenty for a long, a big part of the off season, and then. Uh, I had to move him down a little bit because it just looked like he's like well behind Zach Ertz right now. But I don't like how long is Zach Ertz gonna stay healthy and how quickly does Sin- I don't think Sinet is like in a Sam Laporta type situation at this point because of because of the presence of Zach Ertz, who mm-hmm. is still the wily vet and can still do some things. Uh, so I'm interested to see how that all pans out. I wanted to mention Juwan Johnson, who's healthy now yep. and could be a, a weapon at tight end. I don't know if his snaps are going to be there if Taysom Hill's on the field a lot, if that affects him or not. I mean, it if Taysom be... Hill's in the backfield or who knows where else in the lineup, <laughs> my it's chair very just, possible both are out there. My chair just gave out on me, so it must be a, uh, a Taysom Hill fan. Um, <laughs> if you heard that noise. Uh, Mike Kosicki is also interesting for the Bengals. Um, mm. Back-to-back, I, I was, you know, Tanner Hudson uh, was had a good uh, season, a good stretch last season. I thought he was kind of a sleeper heading in, and Gasicki was just sort of going to be depth. But it looks like Gasicki is going to be the red zone target, uh, the the you know the main tight end for the Bengals, and he's got you know he's the argument against Johnny Smith because he is super athletic sure. and yep. and Mike uh, Mike McDaniel didn't utilize him uh, when he was there his last season in Miami. So um, I think for Cincy, he's got back to back seven hundred yard seasons in his career before those back-to-back 700 yard seasons he had 500 yard season super athletic guy big frame uh does offer some touchdown upside there for joe burrow so he's an intriguing and you know it seems like these guys are cycling through since he on one-year deals to to get paid elsewhere and i think maybe the next one in that in that sort of uh frame as a former massive gesticky truther i would absolutely love that this might be the best quarterback play he'll have ever seen so I don't hate it. All right. That was a, a butt ton of names. Hopefully you wrote them all down. Uh, good luck drafting them all, or at least some of them. Um, we will close it out there. Uh, anything to look for in this uh, last few days of the week and then the next week, the week that football returns from you, John? Yes, my last draft article, uh, final thoughts for the last draft weekend will be out hopefully Friday. Uh, I think that's the deadline on that. Uh, so I got to write that in the next couple of days, just kind of talking about this late, these late, uh, off season stuff. These, uh, a lot of it we talked about with, you know, with the guys going on IR and, and going on pup and stuff and how to deal with them. These late risers, what, what to draft them because, uh, ADP won't have a time to catch up necessarily to the stuff. So if you go into your draft and you want a certain player, but he's on the rise, you kind of have to have an idea when you, when to draft him and I'll at least allow you to, <laughs> get into my brain and to try to figure out where I might be drafting them. Beautiful stuff. 
Uh, and then you will all see us on the Most Accurate Podcast once the season starts on Fridays. Uh, we will be doing the start sit, news, interesting notes, matchups, all that goodness. Uh, technically after Thursday Night Football, but leading into the primary part of the week into your weekend. So look for that. Uh, I will also be doing all the waiver stuff here at Full for Four in the season, so you'll get to look for that. That's the real way to win your leagues. The drafts are important, but waivers. Mm. Uh, and we will see you throughout. Here comes the season. Hooray. Finally. See you then. Adios.